Good morning. Here we are again at the physics video lecture. Physics 105B video lecture 30. And we're talking about the motion of the rigid body and our demo object for today is a book. And you'll notice I tied string around the book because I'm going to throw this thing around a bit. But we know the moment of inertia of this thing. So let's go, let me go ahead and get started writing a few things down. <clears throat> We're looking at the rigid body motion. The free unsymmetrical top. So that's going to be force free. symmetrical top and the book is the perfect right we called this the box when we um, integrated it up the moment of inertia so we have complete control over this thing this is a pretty uniform object right here so what we mean is that I1 is not equal to I2 not equal to I3 and without any loss of generality we're going to say I sub 1 less than I sub 2 less than I sub 3. <clears throat> so what are these 1, 2, and 3 axes? So two axes of the body system are given right here, and the third one is pointing at you guys. So let's see if I set it up x, y, z like this then this would be the x-axis. And the moment of inertia, actually no, this way here. The moment of inertia about this axis here is smallest. So this is I sub one, and this is our x-axis right here. Moment of inertia is smallest because these masses times distance squared are the smallest here from this axis. And the intermediate, moment of inertia, so okay, this is the smallest. The intermediate one would be this one right here, okay? These are the distances, mass times distance squared, of course, is greater in this dimension than it was in this dimension, okay? Now, in the limit of a flat body, which this book is not quite flat, but I'll mention the limit of the flat body, the sum of these two, would equal I sub 3. So I, but this isn't quite flat, but nonetheless, it'll be close. And the distances from this axis here, you know, sum up the squares at least as the other two, some of the other two. So good, we have the rotation about this axis, the rotation about this axis here, and then the rotation about this one. I'm going to demonstrate these by throwing the book in a moment, but first let's see what the Euler equations say about this. Good, so we have Euler equations. We had them written down last time. We can write d omega 1 dt is equal to i2 minus i3 divided by i sub 1, omega 2, omega 3, and cyclic. So I'll write all three of them down. d omega 2 dt, i 3 minus i 1, over i 2, omega 3, omega 1. And the last one will fit on the next board. Right underneath here. D omega 3 dt I1 minus I2 over I3 omega 1 omega 2. <clears throat> yeah, 2 minus 3, 1 minus 2, 1. Good. So those are the Euler equations. 
and suddenly they're not so easy anymore. The reason we were able to solve them last time is because one of these omegas was constant, and by plugging that, and that was omega three was constant, and by plugging that into here and here, we had these two linear equations. But now we have nonlinear differential equations. So nonlinear, highly nonlinear, difficult to solve. Unsymmetric top can actually be solved. Landau Lipschitz has it, uses some special functions that we're not that we, we don't know yet. Um, but we're not gonna go there. We're going to get some essential aspect of it without the full solution. And first of all, these equations do have trivial solutions. So there are trivial solutions, comma, however. And that is motion around a principal axis. Because say you're, you have, a, suppose you have omega is equal to omega zero, zero. So you just have omega around the, omega, the x1 axis. Yeah, in that case, omega two and omega three are zero. So omega two is zero here. Omega 2 is 0 there, and omega 3 is 0 there. Those suffice to have the d omega t be equal to 0 for all three components, which means that omega is constant. And therefore, rotation around a principal axis. And the same thing will go if you have 0. So let's go ahead and write this rotation about a principal axis. So those are solutions, and I'll demonstrate them in a moment. Um, so there would be this one, omega equals omega zero zero equals zero omega zero and or more. <coughs> In each case, if you have two of three of these omegas vanishing, you get d omega dt equals zero for all three cases. So, rotation about a principal axis, these are these trivial but not unimportant solutions. And here's, I'm gonna do a demonstration. You guys have to do this at home as well, okay? So get a nice book that has three that have to be too nice, right? But that has three clearly different moments of inertia and wrap it with string, but otherwise when you toss it, it's gonna be bad, okay? So here's the, here's the demo. And, and it's a free rigid body. Now, of course, we're under the force of gravity, but if I throw this thing, it's in free fall. And in the accelerated frame, it's as though it were a free body. By the way, that's our next chapter, motion in accelerated frames, but be that as it may. So what you do is you try this, okay, and I'll show you from the side, you're just flipping it, and that's the stable motion about that axis, and the Z axis on end, it looks like this from the side, like this. If you can track this in slow motion, okay. That's what, that's, those are the rotations we're talking about here. I just did this one and this one. How about we draw a attempt at the drawing of the box. X1, X2, X3. What we mean is we've got the book here. You guys do a better job. Those are those three moments of inertia. And, uh, so 
Okay, be that as it may. Now here's the important thing. I showed you the rotation about the smallest moment of inertia, axis the smallest moment and the largest. What about the intermediate one? Okay, this is where things get interesting. What you will find is if you try your best to flip it and catch it as I did before, here's side view, it's going to always tumble, okay? This is the mystery. Why is it tumble? These, these tosses here do not tumble, okay? They keep spinning this way. This one does a twist and a turn, and try as you might, you can't get it to not tumble. I don't know if that's going to show up on the video, but that's why you guys have to do this on your own as well. So from this direction, again, it's the intermediate axis, and it tumbles. So that's the demo. unstable. That's what we're going to call it. It's unstable. It will always tumble. And you want to convince yourselves of that by doing this as well. Okay, so. So, it's not stable. I'm just going to call it tumbling motion. It's just, it can, the moment, the, uh, angular velocity vector simply can't be held constant, otherwise it would just keep flipping this way, but it does these twists okay, as it goes around. So that's what we're referring to here, and the technical term that it's unstable is what we're going to investigate, because that instability is an example of what's called a dynamical instability. It's not apparent in these three equations. These three equations tell us that we should be able to have free rotation about any of those principal axes. We find it impossible to maintain a stable rotation about the intermediate principal axis. Okay. So, we can put more words to that, but that's the point. Engineers have to know this. If you're designing a rotating satellite that you're going to put in orbit somewhere, and if you try to get it to rotate about an intermediate axis, it's going to tumble. It's not going to be stable. Okay. So what I want to do, because this is an example of a of something that's pretty important throughout physics, is I'm going to give a discussion of the theory of linear instability, kind of in a general sense, and then we'll return to these equations. And we'll see that these equations are a perfect example of what we're talking about, a, non a system of nonlinear equations that shows a dynamic instability. So that's what we're going to do next. That'll give us an analytical explanation and demonstration that the, it really is necessarily unstable. Something that is not apparent from just an analyzing or just looking at the equation of motion. Okay. So as far as the linear stability analysis, so this topic is linear stability now, so I'm going to leave this exact example and just talk about it a little more general, and then we'll return to it. Anything else? 
this here. Well, you can fill in some more words of wisdom up here. This is what, what we're talking about. So linear stability analysis for a differential equation x dot, so am I using dot or just dx dt? Okay, dx dt. So for a differential equation dx dt equals f of x. This is the type of situation we're studying. x can have you know, up to n variables. You know, x equals x1 to xn. And in the case of, there's the remnant equation up there. In this case here, our x is the omega 1, 2, and 3. So omega has three components. And you'll notice the right side is a vector function of those variables. And that's what we had up there. Okay, Because we have three components, three equations. So this is just a generalization naming the the components x1 to xn instead of omega 1 to omega 3. So we have a differential equation of this form and we do know some seemingly trivial solutions. Okay. So if you have a differential equation of this form with f of x sub 0 is equal to zero. Again, that's exactly what we had with our three uh, principal axis rotations. Okay, the right side of the entire equation was zero. That's what we're saying for certain values of that vector. Um, okay, so. x0 is a solution. You know, it would seem like a trivial solution because this is a constant vector and its derivative is 0 and f of x0 is 0. And you could call that a stationary solution. Okay, so that's what we're working with. And how do we analyze this now? Okay, I've just translated omega to x, but we have all of these things right here. Uh, criteria fulfilled. So in the space here, we have some point x0. The question is, what happens to solutions around that point x0? So what about solutions x of t that are close to x0? So it's a question of some small perturbation to that system. Okay, well, I was going to formulate this. Given an initial condition find out something about the behavior without completely solving this nonlinear differential equation. Okay. I didn't specify that it's nonlinear. It can be linear or nonlinear. If it's nonlinear, it's what we had up there. Okay, so that's the problem. And there are a couple possibilities. You could take something in the vicinity of x sub 0 here as your initial condition. Okay. 
Okay, so this is your initial condition X here, and it could run away. Okay, and we would say it's unstable if it either stays close to X sub zero, or maybe settles in on X zero. Then we would say it's stable. Okay, so let me formulate that. Bit. away from x0, then it's unstable. x0, then unstable. We're going to get into phase space later this semester, and then we'll actually be able to visualize it formally. But for the moment, here's your stable point. X0, and just like that picture up there, you've got some region around it that's close to X0. And the thing is, does an initial condition stay in this region here? This is X. Does it wander around this region? Does it actually maybe converge back to X0? Or does it leave? You know, and if it leaves this region, then we say it's unstable. So the way we deal with that now we have this basic system of differential equations here, is we linearize it. So next, linearization of what we always call star right there. Linearization of star. So here's the Taylor expansion. So we have f of x equals f of x zero plus, I, you know, let's do this with an individual first. So f sub i of x. Okay, so that's just one component equals f sub i x0 plus, now we're going to linearize it so we know that we have the sum of df sub i dx sub j evaluated at x0 times x sub i minus x0 sub i, in words, j. J. Or J equals 1 to n. So we're just expanding to the linear terms plus higher order terms. But this time we have a whole vector full of these. So instead of 1, we have n of these. But this generalizes nicely f vector of x equals f vector of x0 plus. And now since this is you know, a scalar product as we've always known, I'm going to write d f vector of x0. And this is a matrix, and I'm multiplying it with vector x minus x0. So this is the Taylor expansion, and this thing df of x, which is just a matrix, let's go ahead and put a red box around it. That just has, you know, it's ij components df i dx j. So plus and so on, comma, with df ij 
is equal to D F I D X J. And of course, evaluate it at X zero. Evaluate it at X zero. So yeah, it's, it's the row times column as usual. Row times column. Okay. So yeah, this is the linearization and we're well on our way. Okay, so now we're linearizing this differential equation. So let's look at what we have. I'll leave that up right there. Now I gotta choose another letter. Now let we'll call it Z this time. X minus X zero. So this is gonna be our small quantity. We have dot or I'll write DZDP DX DP. So the left side of this differential equation, we can just write DZDP DZDP vector. Remember F of X zero is equal to zero, but I'll go ahead and write this out anyway. F of x0 plus df of x0 and the x minus x0 that we have here is now the z. And because this is 0 because of where we started at, we have a linear differential equation where dz dp equals matrix times z itself. So we've arrived at D, Z, D, E equals the matrix times Z. Linear differential equation or system of linear differential equations with constant coefficients. Right? These derivatives have all been evaluated and so it's uh, system of linear differential equations, constant coefficients, perfect system to analyze. So, good, that's served its purpose. We know what these matrix elements are, they're just defined right here. Remember that f of x zero was zero, so that's how we were able to strike that away. And of course, there would be more, maybe I should, there would be and there are higher order terms. But we're leaving it at this because we're keeping z small, as arbitrarily small as we need. else to be said about this. The theory of small oscillations that we did in Lagrangian mechanics can principally be formulated this way as well. In that case, it's simpler to expand your potential to quadratic terms um, and then work your way through. But actually what we end up with in that theory of small oscillations is a an equation roughly of this form. It has a matrix in front of it as well. It's a little more complicated. Okay. But principally you can do this type of thing. It takes a little more coordinate transformation. So that's what we have here. Uh, system of linear differential equations with constant coefficients.
So essentially, we've already been here in terms of the solution theory. Let's just go ahead and write it down again. I can erase this. So the solution, and this is also named star, okay. solution to star. Just a question of nomenclature. Let's see how we're going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to write it one more time. D, V, D, T, matrix A times V, just for simplicity. So we have this matrix. That's its definition there. Let a sub lambda be an eigenvector of the matrix A with the eigenvalue lambda. saying is the solution to this differential equation, then dz dt is equal to lambda a e to the lambda t, so better erase this, but this is an eigenvector is equal to A times A e to the lambda t. Because A is an eigenvector. Because A times A equals lambda times A. That's the definition of an eigenvector. So this really is a solution to our linearized differential equation. Okay. Now it remains to ask, what does that have to do with the behavior? What does that have to do with the stable or unstable behavior? Well, that is locked into the, or is revealed by the analysis of the eigenvalue lambda. So yeah, let's go ahead and use this board right here. Stability slash instability of Z, which was guy right there. Let's, in fact, let's write it this way. Z of t is equal to a e to the lambda t. Vector a, but now lambda is a complex number. We have a e to the real part of lambda times t plus i times the imaginary part of lambda times t. So real part of lambda times t plus i imaginary part of lambda times t. So the criterion for stability and instability is this. If lambda has a real part, and if that real part is positive, then this function, this vector z, is going to grow without bounds. So if the real part of lambda 
is greater than zero, then z will grow without bounds, grows exponentially, then that means we have an unstable solution. So z is unstable. On the other hand, if real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero, if there's an if, then we have stability. The imaginary part just co contributes an oscillatory contribution. We don't care about an oscillatory contribution as long as this vector doesn't grow. So as long as the real part is less than or equal to zero, then z is stable. So this will be unstable if the real part is greater than zero, then we have instability. Okay, let's see how we're doing time-wise today. Perfect. So we'll see if we have enough of this on the board just to speak in generalities. Um, I'll just put this up here again so that we can look at it. You know, we started with dx dt is f of x. It was our so-called differential dynamical system differential equation. And then we had f of x zero is equal to zero. Okay. Well, these are the ingredients. And then what you do is you expand this function here to first order, which is to say you linearize it and the to justify throwing away all the higher order terms, you have to keep x minus x zero very small. We've, we've actually done a lot of this um, in a different connection. This is actually going to bring a lot of things together that we've done. So yeah, you keep x minus x zero small, then I rename it, and I end up with a linear differential equation with constant coefficients. These are all those derivatives of df i dx j okay, right there. So yeah, then. It's a simple eigenvalue problem. Once I have that matrix, I'm just asking about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I don't even have to calculate the eigenvectors necessarily. If I just want to know the instability, I just have to find the eigenvalues. Let me put that down in words. Because I didn't actually write. Oh, I did. Eigenvalue lambda. So yeah, the strategy, let me go ahead and write this all down now in one, now that we've generated it all, we just write down the recipe that we're following. Summarizing, as it were. That's our differential equation. And the second point is that there is a stationary solution, f of x0 equals 0. And then the third thing is that we do the expansion, but we just need this matrix aij is equal to d f i d x j evaluated at x zero. So that matrix is a matrix of constant coefficients. Um, and for 
define eigenvalues of the matrix AIJ. In our case, we have a three by three matrix. And then finally, three, four, five, if real part of the angles AIJ uh, lambda of K, K equals one to M. You know, generally you'll have M divided. So if real part of lambda sub K is greater than zero, then we have instability. Otherwise we can call it stable. So what we're going to do is analyze our system, analyze the free uh, unsymmetrical top, uh, Euler equations, and what we'll find is this matrix has a lot of zeros in it, it's not going to be difficult to do the analysis at all. Also, what we're going to do is just analyze the motion around one axis, so we only have to do it once, and then we can just shuffle the meaning of I1, I2, and I3 um, to do the analysis. So we're actually only going to have to find one eigenvalue, and then we'll prove that the intermediate axis is the one that actually has um, the instability. That'll be homework, but I'll probably do it on the next lecture as well, so you'll really work along. And, you know, I think I'll save that for next time. So that's homework, but I'll probably do it. We'll do it together, so to speak. Um, you know, what we have is this. We have D omega dt three component vector equals f of omega, right? That's what we have. In the x we have omega. And what we can do is let omega zero, we can choose any one we want. We could do this, omega zero zero. And then and analyze analyze eigen value lambda for all the cases that we need. So we can say I1 less than I2 less than I3. Okay. We expect to find this one to be stable, but we could have I2 less than I1 less than I3. And then I1 would be the intermediate one that we're going through. So this one we would expect to be unstable. And the other combination we could do is I3 less than I1 less than I2. So if we did if we did this, we would just analyze the same expression three times, and this would be the one that we expect to be unstable because it, I1 would then have been chosen to be the intermediate moment of inertia. Okay, so that's the homework. Like I said, I'll probably work this next time or, or make sure we get started on it. An interesting problem, very interesting problem. And I'm going to continue on this discussion because we can analyze some things we've done as trial systems as well. So we'll continue with this discussion next time. The main assignment that we're actually doing is this, but I'll add a couple things to it as well. Good, so let's let that be it for now, and we'll see you all next time.